In this second PEAT tutorial, we'll look at aligning and averaging subvolumes from a simple synthetic data set. We'll use projects Example 1 and Example 2 in the PI sample data set. As usual, the sample data and projects can be downloaded from the URL shown on the screen. This data set is comprised of two volumes, PI A.REC and PI B.REC. Each contains three particles similar to the Greek letter PI. IMOD model points, numbered 1 through 3 from left to right and indicated by the green spheres, have been placed at the approximate centers of each particle. This example is noise-free and there are no artifacts from missing tomographic data. Appropriate settings have already been entered into each sample project, so let's open project pi.epe in example 1 and take a look at those settings. You can see that we've specified the input volumes and associated models in the volume table. The initial modal and tilt range settings are not needed here and will be covered later. We also need to select an initial reference against which the remaining particles will be aligned during the first iteration. You can specify one of the sample particles as we've done here, a user supplied reference, or a multiparticle reference. Notice that in PEAT, the terms particle and subvolume are used interchangeably. Volume size gives the size of the subvolumes to be aligned and averaged. To ensure proper alignment, however, volume size must be padded by at least twice the largest search distance used at any iteration. So, for example, if a cube, 48 voxels on a side, was sufficient to contain the region of interest, and if the maximum search distance was 6 voxels, I'd specify a volume size of 60 rather than 48. Scrolling down to the bottom of the Setup tab, we can determine how the particle's y-axes are determined. PEAT uses two coordinate systems. Translations are specified in tomogram X, Y, and Z coordinates, with Z being the vertical or slice direction, and Y the tilt axis. For rotations, it's more appropriate to use a particle coordinate system, which you can picture as attached to and moving with each individual particle. We'll see examples where this is useful in later tutorials. In this case, the particles have no preferred axis, so we've set each particle's initial y-axis to be identical to the tomogram y-axis. Pete stores alignments, that is, rotations and translations for each particle, in files called motive lists. We can use an initial motive list to specify starting orientations for each particle. In this case, no such information is available, so we've selected set all angles to zero, which leaves the particles in their original orientation. That completes the settings on the Setup tab, so we'll move on to the Run tab. The Parallel Processing section at the top of the Run tab determines how work is distributed among processors on the local network. Consult the IMOD documentation for instructions on how to configure and use these controls. Scrolling down, we come to the Iteration table, which is one of the most important PEAT controls. PEAT runs typically proceed iteratively, with alignments using successively finer angular steps at subsequent iterations. At each iteration, a new reference is generated for use in the following one. This approach is preferred over a single search using a large number of very fine angular steps for two reasons. First, it requires far fewer search steps and as a result executes much more quickly. Second, the original reference will often be a single particle and may suffer from noise and missing tomographic data. Generating new references as the alignment proceeds minimizes these difficulties, allowing the reference to improve incrementally. Phi, theta, and psi specify angular search ranges around the particles y, z, and x axes respectively. For each angle, a search will be performed from minus max to plus max degrees in increments of size step. Appropriate values are dependent on the specific data set, but we can give some general guidelines. For the moment, let's skip over the first iteration and concentrate on the middle of the table where these patterns are more applicable and more apparent. First, for each of the three angles, the value of max at a given iteration should be at least one and a half times that of step at the previous iteration. This ensures that an apparent peak found at one iteration will not be lost at the following one. Second, a 3 to 1 ratio between max and step provides a good compromise between speed and accuracy. Finally, notice that when the 3 to 1 ratio is used, the values in each column can be reduced by a factor of 2 at subsequent iterations. Now consider the first iteration. 
Since we have no advance information about the particle's orientations in this example, we'll do a full spherical search. Since these data are noise-free and the particles distinctively shaped, we'll use an unreasonably coarse search step of 20 degrees. We could specify a max of 180 degrees for phi and 1 of theta and psi, with 90 degrees for the other, and a search step of 20 degrees for each. That would work, but would result in a highly inefficient search. To understand why, imagine a globe with points placed every 20 degrees in both latitude and longitude. At the equator, the points are well spaced, but they get closer and closer at extreme latitudes, and at the north and south poles, 18 redundant points would lie right on top of each other. PEAT provides an optimized spherical search option at the first iteration to avoid these problems. Here you can see we've selected the spherical search option with a step of 20 degrees in phi. The sample interval determines the equatorial spacing in psi and is typically set equal to the phi step as we've done here. Search distance specifies the maximum translational shift in each dimension at a given iteration. Appropriate values are determined both by the structure in question and by possible modeling errors. Low-pass filtering can be used to minimize the impact of high-frequency noise on the alignment. Since these data are noise-free, we've disabled such filtering by setting the point at which high-frequency attenuation begins to the Nyquist frequency, or one-half the sampling rate. Finally, we've specified that out of the six available particles, the four with the best correlation scores should be used to generate a new reference at the end of each iteration. Using roughly two-thirds of the available particles is a reasonable guideline for electron tomography, since it includes enough particles to give good noise suppression, but allows for excluding some particles which may be damaged or poorly imaged. Next, we need to specify the number of particles to be averaged when alignment is complete. Here, we've chosen to create averages with two, four, and six particles. We could have achieved the same result by specifying 2, 2, and 6 as start, increment, and end, respectively. Start, increment, and end can also be used simultaneously with additional numbers, as long as the latter are monotonically increasing and greater than end. Because we're using multiple volumes, we've told Pete to prefer equal numbers of particles from each volume when creating averages or references. In more realistic examples, this can help minimize bias in the results. Finally, there are a series of optional and advanced features which are described in the online guide and won't be discussed here. With the settings complete, we can press Run to start the alignment. After waiting for the processing to complete, we can examine our three averages in 3D mod, and you'll see that they're perfect, as you'd expect for a toy data set like this. We can also open the references used at the various iterations. And you'll notice a couple things. First, the reference volume is larger than the average. This is done so that the reference can be rotated to match a subvolume in any orientation without clipping the corners. Pete chooses the reference size for you automatically, except when a user supplied external reference is specified. In that case, you're responsible for ensuring that the reference you provide is large enough. Additionally, notice that neighboring particles have led to faint ghost particles in the reference from later iterations. These cause no problems in this case, but are a good example of one reason you might choose to use a reference mask. I'll exit from the user interface and do a directory listing, and you can see that a substantial number of files have been created, even with this small example. For speed, PEAT alignments are run in parallel chunks. A log file will be created for each chunk. Log files contain a wealth of information and are the first place to look for clues as to whether your alignment behaved properly, as well as for details on any errors or warnings. The three averages we requested are in MRC files tagged avgvol and with a suffix indicating the iteration number and the number of particles averaged. References, both before and after masking, are also saved in MRC files with a ref tag and a suffix indicating the iteration at which the reference would have been used. Notice that since we performed six alignment iterations, the final output has a suffix of seven. 
Similarly, motive lists for each volume and iteration are saved in CSV format. Once again, the suffix refers to the iteration at which they would have been used, not the iteration at which they were created. Often, when starting an alignment, estimates may be available for the orientations and, perhaps, translations required to align the particles. Let's look at how such information can be used to do a quicker and potentially more accurate alignment. In the present dataset, the leftmost particle in the upper volume is the reference. You can see that a roughly 60 degree clockwise rotation around the tomogram z-axis would be required to align the second particle with the reference, and an approximately 45 degree counterclockwise rotation for the third particle. In the Example 2 project directory, I've placed these angles in a file named anglesa.csv with the fields in each row representing so-called slicer angles, namely rotations in degrees about the x, y, and z tomogram axes respectively to be performed in reverse order. The slicer angles required for particles in the second volume are less obvious. For demonstration purposes, we can estimate them by rotating the particles manually in 3D Mod's slicer or ISO surface view to match the desired reference orientation, and then simply reading off the desired angles. I've done that with the results that you can see in angles B. Pete uses motive lists, however, which store rotations in a different representation. Fortunately, there's a PEAT program called Slicer to Modal to do this conversion. Like all PEAT programs, it has an associated man page documenting its use. I'll convert both angles A and angles B to initial motive lists named Pi A init modal and Pi B init modal. If we look at the results, you'll see that the angles for Pi A look identical to those in angles A but with the opposite sign, while those in Pi B appear quite different than angles B. This is a result of the Euler angle representation used in motive lists. Now that we have initial motive lists, we'll need different project settings to make use of them. The required changes have already been made in Project Pi in directory example 2. Scrolling down to the bottom of the Setup tab, you'll see that we've changed initial motive list to User Supplied Files. This enables the initial modal field in the volume table, and we've selected the newly created initial motive list for each volume. With better starting estimates for initial particle orientations, we no longer need a full spherical search, and the iteration table has been modified accordingly. We now use four iterations rather than six, and the resulting alignment runs in roughly half the time, but yields virtually identical results. Of course, with a data set this small, speed is not really an issue, but it certainly can be when averaging thousands of particles. So now you've been introduced to the majority of Pete's controls and have seen how to use them on a simple data set. In the following tutorials, we'll turn to real tomographic data and we'll see how to handle some of the issues that arise there.